Right, my name is John Fenterman. Uh, I'm a quadriplegic now, as you can see. Uh, originally, my parents came from England. My father was a butcher and my mother was a tailoress. Uh, the family settled in Subiaco. Uh, from there, uh, they went east and I was born in New South Wales. Uh, that was in the 1930s. Uh, during the war years, uh, my parents split up and uh, I went into a boy's home for a while. And then uh, when I was nine, we came back to WA and uh, I lived with my aunt in Hay Street. I grew up in, uh, I went to East Beth Primary School and then uh, Scarborough State School. Uh, Scarborough at the time was only a, uh, an outer suburb of Perth really. Uh, there was great straight uh, bushland out there and uh, the Scarborough Beach Road was uh, quite a busy road but a very narrow road at those days. Uh, from there I went to Perth Boys and at uh, age of 14 I left uh, Perth Boys to start an apprenticeship. Uh, to try to get an apprenticeship in those days was a bit hard. Uh, originally I worked on a, a farm at Way, uh, Woburn and uh, I got a driver's licence up there, that was the only advantage I had, I thought. Uh, however, after three months, a firm that I'd written to uh, sent me a letter saying that uh, they were prepared to take me on as an apprentice. So uh, I started in a jobbing shop called uh, Crump and Cornish, a small engineering firm. We used to manufacture uh, wood thickness machines, uh, cross-cut saw, uh, twin cross-cut saws, uh, paint mixing machinery, and uh, odd gears that were made for uh, specialised uh, uh, different uh, machinery. So it was a good apprenticeship to start off with, but then I transferred from there uh, because it wasn't big enough, or at least I didn't think it had enough range of, of engineering uh, machinery, and I wanted to get a, a real broad background. So I went to Chamberlain John Deere, I transferred over. And then it was just called Chamberlain's. I was uh, a strong unionist type of person, and I believed in the union and the working conditions of the working man. Uh, I think that from my parents' viewpoint, uh, they were strong Labour people at the time. So uh, I took a, an interest in the unions and uh, became a shop steward, uh, as well as uh, uh, doing my trade. I finished my time as a fitter and turner, and uh, then was given the advantage of uh, becoming a tool maker. Uh, because I worked in the tool room and from there on uh, I started uh, a, a, an extra two years as a tool maker. Uh, by then I went into the army, uh, I got called up for national service and did my six months with the uh, army uh, then uh, was on, uh, uh, what do they call it, I've forgotten now what they call it, uh, but on reserve in the reserve army for three years. Uh, I did a lot of truck driving there and was in mortars and machine guns. Um, I actually held the record for uh, pulling a machine gun to pieces and reassembling it. Uh, I could do that in two minutes. Uh, and whether it was because of my skill as a tradesman or not, I'm not sure, but uh, I held that record for, for some time. Uh, we used to, in the army, used to do blindfolded so that uh, we really knew how to do assembly of the machine gun and that was uh, a, an interesting experience, a very enjoyable uh, time I had in the army. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, from there I applied to go to uh, Aberdeen Maritime School which uh, because I had a, a diesel ticket I wanted to do a steam ticket and that way it would give me a, a greater range of employment in the future. Uh, the engineer in charge of Chamberlain's at the time, uh, his brother actually was in Scotland and he arranged for me to uh, do this course. However, I was now just 22 and uh, in December I had a car accident and uh, broke my neck. Uh, the car accident was quite a simple accident, it wasn't uh, fast speed, I was returning from a funeral 
and approaching Lesnerty Hill, which is in the out suburbs of Perth, West Australia. The, uh, the sun was, it was five to two, and I was approaching the hill, and the cars were coming down the hill, and the chrome reflecting from the, the sun uh, made me close my eyes for that second or two. Uh, at least the chap beside me said the same thing, because uh, I had two other people in the car, uh, no seat belts, safety belts in those days. Uh, the, the door opened as the car rolled, and I went out and, and broke my neck. Um, at that time, the ambulance were uh, housewives, uh, housewives, uh, because uh, it was a voluntary ambulance service. And they came down and uh, they lifted me up into the stretcher, onto a stretcher, and then into the ambulance and uh, sat me up halfway up and to take me to hospital, which would, because of absolutely a no no in today's uh, medical. Approach. However, after uh, original diagnosis for my condition, uh, having a tracheotomy put in for breathing and uh, the x rays showing my paralysis, uh, at the, originally they couldn't determine it because uh, they couldn't find the break that was there. They, medically, they knew I was quad, but they couldn't find it. and. Uh, Sir George Bebrook, or Mr Bebrook at the time, came up from Bunbury, determined what the problem was, x-rayed me at a 45 degree angle, showing a nice clear break. So that's how uh, I started off. The approach uh, for... Uh, After admitted to Royal Perth Hospital and uh, told that I was a quad, I, I, th I thought I was an amputee, actually. I thought I'd lost my legs rather than the, the severity of my accident. Uh, I had a trachea inserted and uh, I had weights put on the back of my head, 16 pound weights, uh, going through a pulley system. Uh, they're called Riley braces, I believe, uh, were fitted to my head. I had no movements in my hands at all. I was told I was a C6 quad complete at that lesion uh, and they tested that by my fingers uh, they were totally placid uh, and I had no feeling in the first two finger, uh, the little finger and the next finger in both hands and I still had no feeling under the arms and on those fingers. Uh, only the top three and the thumb have I got feeling um, and I got no feeling from about an inch below my tracking in my neck. Uh, so that's where my feeling line is. Um, I still have triceps, I can lift my arms above my head, which is uh, great, um, and I haven't been able to explain that, uh, and even to George was not able to explain how I've been successful, and, and having the nerve line that uh, still gave me full tricep movement, and uh, the biceps, so uh, I can't explain that, and I don't think the doctor's scanalists they find out when I'm deceased. Uh, which is a, a very important thing, actually, I think, uh, that one should uh, donate one's body for research if it has advantage to others in the future. But uh, in the initial stages, uh, it was very hard to accept, uh, cuffing your hands together. We were uh, immediately started by bandaging the hands and having a spoon put in bandages to feed yourself straight away. It was something that didn't, they didn't wait for two, two or three weeks. It was immediate. Um, and that was a real shock, uh, I must admit, uh, a great shock. Uh, uh, within uh, four weeks, I suppose, I was start, they were trying to set me up uh, with a plate on top of my chest and to feed yourself, uh, because that was the whole approach to everything in those days. Uh, there was no uh, uh, grieving period, uh, you weren't allowed to have grieving period. You were immediately thrown into uh, rehabilitation, you know. Uh, and I think that Sir George got that from uh, when he was in uh, England under Dr. Gertman. Apparently, uh, Dr. Gertman, uh, who started the Paralympics and 
and started the spinal unit in England had that approach that uh, you didn't allow people to uh, fall into go into remorse. You immediately got them uh, rehabilitated on a program of rehabilitation uh, and uh, didn't give them time to think about their, their disability sort of thing. Well, Sir George had a very... He was the captain of the ship and he made sure you knew it. <laughs> but, uh, no, he didn't... Uh, Sir George didn't tolerate any uh, uh, nonsense uh, in that sense. Uh, uh, you had to... Sir George insisted that you got dressed, wore your, put shoes on, socks on, and got properly dressed. That was something that Sir George was very dominant about. Uh, you had to uh, be presentable, and uh, none of this tracksuit business, that was just totally out of the, the question. Uh, you got dressed as a normal person, uh, and uh, you start thinking of yourself as a normal person, rather than uh, as a disabled person. That was very strong with him. Uh, uh, and he did cause a lot of uh, bad feelings at times, I can assure you. But uh, all credit to him, he did stick to his guns that way. And uh, it was, he, I mean, his heart was on the right place, there's no question about it. But at times he was a bit hard to deal with. <laughs> but uh, yes, he was a bit hard to deal with. I mean, uh, he had very strong views. And that was one of the reasons why I wrote my play, Play 81, uh, to uh, change things. Uh, I called Play 81 because it was written for the International Year of Disabled, which was just a background of spinal injured uh, people. Um, because I had a big argument with Sir George on uh, fertility of the, of the uh, quad uh, and to become a father. And uh, my argument was... Uh, he had seven children and I had none, and therefore we should discuss uh, the sexual problems of quadriplegia, or paraplegia, but mainly quadriplegia, because that's what I dealt with. Um, and uh, he, would, he would not come to the party on that at all uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it was only after uh, Mr. Alice Griffiths and uh, Mr. Batalan came into the picture that uh, that became an issue in which you would uh, uh, deal with. But uh, he used to say it's di more difficult enough for you to live uh, as a quad than uh, be thinking about fathering children. Oh, I got on well with him. We, we got on well, well, but we did have our points of difference at times, you know. And uh, I was fortunate Mr Dargan, uh, head of OT, and I got on well with it very well. And also uh, Mr Carruthers, the superintendent of the hospital, he was always one person who would act in between. He was a very good mediator between the two of us, or between any person who had, a, had an issue with Sir George. Uh, he would uh, uh, sort of uh, calm waters and, and you could get back to a normal level again, which was the way it should be, I suppose, when you stop thinking. I mean, he had a lot of responsibility in his hands. And uh, he was very good in court when it came to uh, compensation cases with Sir George. I um, mean, he backed it 100%. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, very worthy man, uh, no question about that. And uh, uh, his heart was always in the right place. At the time, you didn't, uh, didn't realise it, but at the time, <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah. And for uh, paraplegia in those days was entirely different to it is today. Uh, we didn't have the star uh, around that we have today and uh, it was all new uh, in many ways. Uh, the spinal unit had only been going for four years at the time down at Shenton Park. Uh, it was still uh, the old uh, typhoid ward and uh, it was all open. It was uh, rather a cold place, I can assure you, because the, uh, there was no uh, solid walls in the place and it was an, an open building. Uh, we were all very close. We all knew everyone, powers and quads. We all knew everyone. Uh, we used to have a lot of Eastern State boys come over from the Eastern States um, because of the rehabilitation side of. Uh, the unit over here. Uh, we were the first, or WA was the first to establish a spinal unit in the full sense of that word. 
and uh, Sir George had come from Stoke Mandeville in England, although he was originally from Melbourne. And he introduced uh, wheelchair sports, uh, Paralympic sports, uh, and uh, the whole program was you had to accept yourself as being normal and not look at yourself as being paralysed. Uh, this meant that you had to get uh, dressed in the morning, you had to go to breakfast in the morning. Uh, there was no such thing as uh, staying in bed or anything like that. It was uh, run more or less, one could say, like a boot camp. But uh, because of the camaraderie we had in that time, uh, it was taken in all good spirit. Uh, I think the uh, today's boys do not appreciate what uh, was required and, and is required uh, to have full rehabilitation. Uh, I stayed 18 months in uh, Chetton Park. Uh, the whole idea was you, you were rehabilitated to the maximum because we didn't have any support services at home at all in those days. Um, your gear was supplied by charity. Uh, only in desperate situations would a wheelchair be supplied by the hospital. So you had to uh, apply to various charities to get your wheelchair and other support. At the time, because the hospital was more bush here, there was the big parks and grounds that there is today. There was a big open uh, grassed area and we had a basketball court. Uh, was uh, put in and of course all the basketball team at that time and archery, darchery, uh, shot put, all this was done on Fridays afternoon and over the weekends. So uh, if you're a patient within the hospital you participated purely for the fact that you made up numbers and that meant uh, you immediately got involved and if you couldn't get involved, there was always somebody around to uh, either uh, put attachments to your arms and say you could pull a bow to do a bit of archery. Uh, if you could play a bit of basketball, uh, you got roped into one of the teams, say that other teams had the competition. So that was all good. Uh, we had a the OT department, we started a metal shop. Myself being a tool maker, at the time I was pushing for welding equipment and to make our own commode chairs because they were not supplied by the government. So you, you had to get your own by hook or by crook. That raised your own money if you earned compensation. Uh, it meant that you uh, you're looking for the dollars, or in those days it was pounds, shillings and pence. And uh, we had a, a, how could I say, there was a cooperation that, that was just unbelievable when, when you look back on it and think about it. Uh, boys helped other boys uh, with difficulties and they were always willing to pass on information how the best way to do things. We started disabled driving here and the first thing we said, well, we've got to make our own hand controls for the cars. So that became a, a feature, uh, Phil Desham and uh, Jeff Lyle and myself, uh, they designed it, we designed it, made it up and we also uh, pushed to get a car on site, which we did. Uh, from a, a car yard down the southwest, it gave us the first car and we put the hand controls in it and then the OTs and the physios assisted us uh, and the local police station in Subiaco uh, was a cooperative and so disabled driving really got established here as part of our rehabilitation program. Uh, that meant that uh, we had a different perspective immediately because we had not only paraplegics but we had quads on, uh, four or five quads learning to drive and being able to, to manage that. They might have had to get somebody to put their wheelchair in and take their wheelchair out of the car, but
but at least they could go from a to point A to point B, uh, and we did have at that time maxi cabs, etc. Uh, this has progressed as times have gone by, as times have moved on. Uh, maxi cabs and all that has come about, but uh, because of the uh, interrelation of the paras and the quads together uh, in a dynamic force, it, it meant that uh, there was uh, moulds to reach. We, we always tried to better uh, and to achieve more. One of the very important things too was in the early days, in the 60s, all the paraplegic sports was done at Shenton Park. So that every Saturday and Sunday you would have boys who had been discharged coming back to play archery, dartery, basketball, weightlifting, uh, uh, javelin throwing, and um, what's the one with the, what's the when they throw the ball? What's it called? Shot put. Shot put. Yeah, and that was the uh, other game. That that was always there. So you always had twenty or thirty uh, paras and quads coming in to participate in training for sport uh, at the weekend. So the new people who were in the ward uh, got to know people before they went out. And of course they'd see the cars and all the rest of it. So there was always that, you know, be one to move out, you know, um, and get into the community and get going, you know, which was uh, something that's gone now. You don't see it at all. You know? and. Uh, uh, I mean, boys have got to move out, out of the spinal unit today, and they're out in the community, but they really don't know other people in the community. And they haven't got that, uh, you know, uh, camaraderie that used to be there. During the 1960s, uh, which was interesting, I used to go down to the hospital and stay for three days per week. Um, 64, 65, and 66, I think. Um, and uh, the reason being, I used to, because of my, my trade, I used to make hand controls and get the boys to, to uh, do hand controls, make their own for their cars. Uh, to us, we used to promote driving down within the hospital as, at that time. Um, and this was a great advantage because it it gave uh, a lot of spirit to the boys to uh, help themselves uh, and get a vehicle and get on the road and become more independent. The chair is ideal for in the house, but a car gives you mobility. And uh, that was one of the things that was very popular at the time. And uh, we originally got the first car uh, from the south, down south. Uh, we, we made the hand controls fitted the vehicle there and left it there for 12 months uh, and then we asked for the hospital to replace it so we got a brand new car. Uh, it was a good way of uh, bypassing the government and getting uh, stuff replaced, uh, which they did. And uh, the driving, uh, disabled driving was done down in Shenton Park. This is no longer the case, it's uh, gone to outside uh, contractors now. Uh, but it also enabled myself and, uh, to meet other quads and to uh, uh, help them uh, become aware of their own abilities uh, and to uh, not uh, fall into remorse or, or just wish to uh, stay at home because uh, they realise you can do things and you can be mobile uh, and that was a big thing. Uh, at the time, we were, there was not big compensation cases paid, and even those who did get compensation never got a large amount. So uh, times have changed, uh, and that's all to the better. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, the quads were taught to uh, to get in and out of a car. We got the car on site, and uh, they were uh, taught to climb in and out of a car uh, using the sliding board. And also, uh, because of the hoists that came out at the time, uh, they put the wheelchair, the hoist on their wheel, uh, the car. That meant that they could get their, uh, take their wheelchair with them, 
so therefore the next thing was driving. The uh, quads were all taught to use the, the cuff on the steering wheel and uh, uh, one boy, Jeff Lyle, used to use a, a rod coming down from his hand to the cuff and used to slide it into a pipe. Uh, he was one of the first and Phil Desham, another quad, uh, he's a 5 on 6 quad. Uh, Jeff Lyle was a 5 on 6 quad. Uh, they were driving and uh, then Eric Leopold later followed on. Uh, uh, they've all been driving and learnt to drive. There have been a couple of others, I can't remember their names now. Uh, Sid Hatch was another boy, a quad, who uh, immediately started driving as soon as he, he could uh, get up in his wheelchair, he wanted to start driving straight away. And uh, that was his big focus, you know, to get his car and get the hand controls on and try to start driving. Uh, and uh, it was a beeline for uh, getting up and getting getting going again. And uh, I think it was a great uh, spur to to the uh, the quads. I mean, paraplegia, of course, that they, they all had their cars, but uh, for quads, it was the thing, uh, and it gave them more independence, uh, and it was great to see. But uh, that, that really took off uh, very well in the, the late 60s, car driving. And uh, I, I'm sorry to see it's not uh, pushed like it used to be. Really, uh, and uh, we did have the cooperation of the police department, I might add, at the time, I, I think. Uh, also, uh, they were uh, very uh, cooperative in uh, assisting the boys uh, to get their licence. Uh, so uh, that that's another aspect of it. Uh, the having the chair lift was the, the great thing. Getting that chair on top of the roof uh, was was a big uh, advancement too. At that time, uh, until that came about, it was you always had to have somebody put the chair in for you. But uh, once we got the chair lift, it was great. Yeah. When I first came into hospital, when we came from Royal Perth. Uh, Originally, we didn't have tilting beds, so you had uh, uh, tilting boards, which you were transferred from your bed to uh, to the bed or to the board. For standing up for drainage uh, for the drain system of the uh, urologically, this was the standard treatment. So, in 1961, Sir George said to uh, a couple of physios and uh, myself at the time, because he knew of my background, he asked us uh, could we make a better bed and we designed the tilting bed made out of a, a, a Hills rotary hoist uh, using that gearing and uh, made the first tilting bed. Uh, in the end we manufactured 300 from Joyce and uh, Fremantle, WA. Uh, and they were the first tilting beds we had in the hospital. They were great uh, in the sense that it meant that better for nursing staff, it was much easier for, for the, the quads in the beds. Neurologically, uh, we had to have a capital change every week, twice a week, to check the residual that we had in our bladder. Uh, this was always a, a bit of trauma at that time, and in my own case, I had a lot of spasm. Now, the spasm got so bad, I used to shoot right out of the wheelchair. My legs would go out in front, and I'd go rigid as a board, and just slide straight out of my chair. Because of that, I had what is called an alcohol block. Uh, I'm the only one in WA who's had an alcohol block because Sir George said he'd never do it to another quad thereafter. Uh, it was only because they only had gave me a few hours to live because I had seizure of the whole uh, urinary sac system that uh, it was done. So we now only ever do pinpoint alcohol blocks. Or, uh, uh, they've got another technical name for it now, but that's what it is. Sorry. And what is going on here? I'm just uh, You've got a clear example there of how bureaucracy is taking over 
the residents in this establishment. It's just, this is what depressing is coming about. And if you talk to other patients here, they would tell you exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just unbelievable. This. When you got discharged, if you couldn't go home, uh, or you couldn't manage at home, you were sent to the home of peace. And that was in Subiaco. Subiaco was very interesting because the home of peace used to have a big sign, home of peace, place for the incurable disease. It was very depressing for a young quad to be sent there. And uh, it was something I made sure I never went to. Uh, when I went home, we didn't have anything set up at home. I couldn't use the bathroom because I stepped down. Uh, it stepped down into the bathroom. And uh, I had to use the outside, we had an outside toilet up in the hills. So I had to have a bathroom built on the outside toilet in which uh, I showered and toilet. So I used to have to get out and go outside and do it outside. It was very primitive when you look back on it. But uh, it was uh, outside of the hospital and it was uh, home. And that was the important thing. The, uh, looking back on that, uh, I think you wouldn't do it today. You wouldn't send a person out in the community the way I went out in the community. But uh, uh, needs must at that time, and uh, uh, that's the way it was done. The establishment of the, quad, the spinal unit here, the uh, quad centre, uh, we, st we were campaigning for that once uh, we realised that there was a, a, quite a number of young people. Uh, we pressed the Parrot Association to build our own place. There used to be the Jack O'Keefe Hostel, which was in Subiaco, but it would only take uh, Paris. And that was uh, given to us through Mr O'Keefe, who was a school teacher and our first president of the Parrot Quad Association. It took us a number of years to raise the money for uh, the quad centre. Uh, we used to sell jam and uh, knickknacks on uh, street stalls. There was uh, an ongoing campaign uh, to raise money and eventually we got the uh, a sum. Uh, Mr uh, Cousins of the Perth Building Society uh, and uh, Mr Malcolm, he was a stockbroker a wheelchair confined person who became the chairman and uh, they uh, were able to put a very good team together and finance became more available and so uh, Sir George was able to say let's build. Uh, we were successful in getting the land right next to the uh, spinal unit which was uh, Crown Land from the University and uh, that was given to us um, and the present site uh, where the quad centre is now. It was originally built with the uh, uh, just the quad centre itself plus a workshop and uh, then uh, further extensions were done. The Jack O'Keefe Hostel was sold, the one in Subiaco and the shop we had in Cambridge Street uh, was sold. Um, it was an op shop and that was sold and so uh, the Jack O'Keefe Hostel was built and uh, that is uh, establishment started, which has proved uh, to be a great advantage over the years, uh, far better than uh, putting young people in with a lot of old people in, a, in the uh, old nursing home system that we had prior to that. Um, I, I didn't get myself too involved once we got the initial building going. Uh, the first plans were drawn up uh, in actual fact, I drew up some plans for the first discussion of how the building should look, uh, modelled on um, the, bar, uh, the, bur the bedrooms, uh, and between each bedroom was to be the bathrooms, two bathrooms back to back uh, for each room, so that uh, we'd had this cyber system. However, it was knocked on the head at the time because 
uh, the high cost of plumbing. Uh, they said no, it was going to cost too much, and uh, therefore they they didn't have that system. They adopted a minor spinal unit system where you had a one brick bathroom, shower and toilet block. This has now, of course, all changed, uh, as we've seen. Uh, today, you have separate bathrooms to the rooms, which is a far better way to go. And uh, that's uh, how the uh, quad centre got going, and uh, it made a big difference to everybody. Mm. And when he uh, deceased, he bequested the uh, house, because it was a very large house, to be turned into a hostel. And that's how we got the Jack O'Keefe Hostel. Um, there was Mrs. Jessie Orton, who was a, a powerhouse of a uh, dynamic lady, and uh, she worked very hard for us, and uh, Mrs. Copley. Uh, and they were the force behind the women's auxiliary that Sir George uh, got together, and uh, they did a, a lot of groundwork for us. Uh, to get the, the quad, the quad centre established uh, and we had to thank Mr Cousins and uh, from uh, Perth Building Society and uh, Mr Malcolm, uh, Mr Dave Malcolm um, who was a uh, uh, quadriplegic uh, stockbroker uh, and uh, he became the chairman he was also involved with uh, Gilbert Grammar School, he was the chairman of Gilbert Grammar School, and a few other uh, uh, professional bodies. And uh, Mr Gooch, who was the uh, a pastoralist from uh, the Northwest, uh, he was a riding accident and uh, was in a wheelchair. And uh, he was left uh, quite an estate which formed the uh, uh, Gooch Trust, etc. And uh, from those begin beginnings we uh, were able to establish a committee to form the uh, quadriplegic centre. Uh, the first plans drawn up, uh, I contributed myself to that, uh, drawing up plans. It was considered too uh, grand uh, the way it was designed. And so we got a miniature design of the spinal unit and had a central toilet block. That came about. Uh, today we have, uh, within the quadriplegic centre, uh, separate bathrooms to uh, two patients and a separate bathroom for each. This came about only in the last 10 years. But uh, before that we were modelled on the spinal unit and I think uh, uh, it has made it better for the, for the uh, patients here uh, to function. Uh, there's not the waiting in corridors uh, to get him to uh, have a shower and to a drink etc. So that's a great improvement and, and something that's needed, always been needed. As pensions increased our conditions have been improved, no end. One of the things I, I do have noted, if we look back on the past and the future, um, it surprised me how those who have not succeeded in getting compensation have gone on to university and, and, and really made a stand because they've had to reach for gold. Those with compensation seem to fall by the wayside they, there's so many have not achieved more by having that advantage. Uh, that's just a little thing that's come about, I believe, over the last 20 years. Uh, we don't get the push for education that we were having way back in the early 60s, late 60s and early 70s. Uh, that's well, with the changing times, and, and with so much supply to the quads, well, to any disabled person today, it's not only quadriplegia, I feel they, they've lost the, the need to be independent. Um, I've been, been in the hospital just recently, and uh, 
the first thing they're offered is electric wheelchair rather than the manual wheelchair to uh, to get around and push around and uh, develop their uh, awareness of uh, using a manual wheelchair um, whereas today it's straight to the electric wheelchair and, and I feel this is a, a bad setting off point for, for the boys because uh, although it is painful for them to start with uh, they do become much stronger and uh, although it's slower they they make, make greater success I think uh, overall in their life period because if they get too attached to an electric wheelchair they put on weight and uh, their health uh, I don't think it's improved by it. But that's my own an observation but I think I'm pretty accurate on it. Yes. And th that's why I like to see uh, the manual chair used as much as possible. So that was the 60s. The 70s were very quiet except when the Whitlam government got in, uh, the Labor government at the time, uh, its time as it, Mr Whitlam's slogan was, uh, all of a sudden the PAD scheme came about which was uh, providing equipment for disabled persons and that meant uh, you got to get chairs, commodes, uh, wheelchairs, uh, commodes, splints and, and whatever is required and it was paid by the government. Uh, you didn't have to beg for it or write begging letters to charities and this made a complete turnaround uh, with uh, our approach to the disability. Um, all of a sudden uh, there was a different, uh, how could I say, an uplifting of a spinal injury because uh, boys uh, became much more independent, uh, took a different viewpoint and things did change. Uh, the university, uh, was, of course, uh, we had to uh, uh, badger the universities into putting in ramps. Uh, I can remember when we uh, wanted one chap wanted to go to law school at UWA. The, uh, they uh, protested quite strongly about putting in a large ramp for him to get into the law school. and. Uh, that caused quite a bit of a, a storm at the time because they reckoned it would upset, upset the architecture approach to the particular building. However, that was solved, but uh, unfortunately he, he left that university and went to Murdoch in the end. Um, but these are the progresses of uh, your, your little wins that we have as we've uh, educated the community over the years that uh, the disabled and are part of society, a growing part of society, now 20% of the population and uh, we have to have our place in the sun. The uh, following uh, university, I worked in the public, in the prisons department for a little while but the, uh, the workload was far too great for me so I gave that away and uh, I also uh, got myself very sick at the time Again, a uh, urinary tract infection and a few other things uh, which I won't bother you about. So I got over that and uh, then uh, we took on uh, Ava Olympics which is work school for the disabled. Uh, I became the secretary for that and also for um, we moved on to an, an, uh, another couple of organisations. I was still involved with people with disabilities then as, as its new name was from DASH. Um, and uh, was pressing for uh, access to modern homes, uh, the, the, uh, trying to get the Builders Federation to acknowledge the 2.5% increase in the cost of building a new home uh, was worth it uh, and it was also better for the government because then they wouldn't be paying out for uh, modifications to homes. Um, this has not been successful. We've uh, used uh, overseas examples of how it's approached, but uh, at this point of time we've still not been successful. The private housing industry still not will come to the party uh, with that. Um, I've always said that the primary toilet should be totally accessible to anybody who goes to a home, and, uh, and also the front door should welcome you rather than having to go around the back or 
whatever. But this is still a problem we have with the building industry uh, in WA, although it is a state, a Commonwealth thing, unfortunately. Um, at one stage I was asked to uh, lecture uh, OT students, which was always an interesting thing because I used to always insist that they read the book The Lady Chatler's Lover. Uh, this was uh, just my little quirk because uh, the, uh, the actual person, the, the prime person in the book is actually a paraplegic and people don't seem to catch on to that until they read the book. And I used to always make the um, students uh, wear a, uh, a jumper and uh, have, uh, bring a pair of socks <laughs> which I used to insist that they uh, had their socks put over their hands uh, and tied up so that they couldn't undo the buttons sort or of thing and then t to try to take the jumper off and a couple of garments uh, off the body so that they'd get some feel of quadriplegia when you haven't got your hands and uh, it just always go down well because uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, fun was uh, given that, but at the same time, the seriousness of the the disability uh, came home to the students. Uh, I, I have been doing this for a long time now, but it, at the time when I was doing it, it was always a, a welcomed uh, uh, lecture. Yeah, well, I have uh, on and off because uh, I've always kept up to date with the Disability Service Commission, and. Uh, been involved with uh, uh, discussing with them at times where people have rung me up who have known of me uh, uh, and we've discussed a few things. I've got me out of focus in the last 10 years because I mean I'm 75 now and uh, I've always felt that the younger ones coming through and, and there have been a number, uh, the person who's interviewed me right now has uh, been involved himself so he knows uh, he, he's taken on the mantle of, of this uh, type of work. Um, so I'm not really involved like I used to be. Uh, and I do regret it sometimes, but then you've got to move on. And younger people have a different approach to uh, their disability now. And they're, they're, when we started the, uh, the basketball wheelies, uh, took over from paraquad uh, sports and then it became wheelies. And they're, they're a big organisation now and uh, going great guns. Uh, we've got Paralympians from that uh, organisation now. Uh, I've always had a background with the sport in the sense of being there but not being a participant uh, in assisting them and raising money for them. When uh, In the early days we used to have a touring group of uh, basketballers and others uh, to do the whole state to raise money and also education, which was a very important thing. And uh, that's where I used to come involved in talking, have, have a talk with people about the disability and uh, where we were going and hoping to go in the future. I thought that was rewarding at the time. It was rewarding. Um, and I got around the state a bit, uh, discussing that with various uh, groups that the basketballers used to go. They were our publicity machines you might say and uh, the others came along and, and discussed it with other people so that uh, throughout the, the state paraplegia was uh, pretty well known then uh, this has now vanished uh, because of funding and the other uh, avenues of uh, communication now but in the earlier days uh, it was a hands-on and uh, getting around the state uh, the uh, Presence Centre is up at the uh, uh, Herb Graham Centre in Mirabuka. Uh, I was involved in that, getting that established because uh, I'm on the City of Stirling Access and Inclusion uh, Committee and uh, when they required a, a new centre I was able to get this uh, large complex for them. So that was a, a very good thing because that's now the head, head office for our paraplegia sports in WA. Um, I've been on a hospital committee for Osmond Park Hospital for 10 years, over 10 years now, 
and uh, I'm now thinking that because of age and because of medical conditions I should uh, resign from that. But uh, we've had a, I've had a good rapport with uh, a number of organisations over the years and uh, I was recognised as a, a valuable person. Uh, in 2000 I was awarded the uh, Centennial Award by John Howard, the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, uh, for my work for the disabled over the years, as I was awarded also uh, nominated, uh, sorry, uh, in 2003 for my work for my community work for the disabled uh, for WA, and uh, that was quite an honour to to uh, have that nomination at that time. I was very pleased, uh, but. Uh, uh, I wasn't the successful person who received the actual award that year.